in in Ukraine we have a special word. It's called kumovstvo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, like you know, helping of the Godfather. Testing the competitors, you're not making anybody within your company look bad. You're making the, the competitors look bad, but it ha has the same uh, effect that people watching it will say, "Oh, geez, we, you know, how how does our stuff do if we do this?" The title is great. It's users don't hate change; they hate you. Hello guys, my name is Andre Sambir, I'm CEO of company LinkUp Studio and today you are listening to Building Digital Product Podcast. Right now in our studio we have Natalia, senior UIX designer with 10 years of experience and head of the design in uh, LinkUp Studio and our guest today is Steven Krug, one of the most famous product designers in the world, a uh, person who worked with such a companies like Apple, Bloomberg, Lexus, and NPR. And also, you may know Steve uh, by the book Don't Make Me Sick, Think. <laughs> Don't Make Me Think, and Sick as well. And uh, in case you consider yourself product designer or UX researcher, uh, so and you don't know about this book, well, most probably you are not a product designer. So, hello, Steve. Nice to see you here. Thank you. That's Actually, that's... I, I have learned that that's less true than it was a few years ago. I, I, it's been interesting to note that there's uh, sort of uh, an upcoming generation of younger UX people and designers who have not heard of me, uh, which, uh, you know, I mean, it's been great fun having people having heard of me. That's, I highly recommend that. Um, but I'm surprised to the extent, even though a lot of people, most people nowadays find out about my book in courses. It gets used a lot in, in courses of which there are many now, uh, or people recommend it. But it used to be that sort of anybody who was going into UX or design had heard of my book. And I find that that's not as true anymore, which is interesting. Okay, so let me start from the first question. Tell me, please, you know, from my experience, all the designer that I know, uh, they becoming who they are, just you know, not just because they were interested in design, but uh, the initial start was su super di different. So how about you? How you did your path to become the product researcher and product designer? I sort of stumbled through a couple of uh, uh, careers, professions, whatever, um, before ending up in what at the time, it wasn't, it wasn't de design or UX even, it was usability was I, I was specifically, you know, in the field of usability because uh, uh, UX wasn't, uh, people didn't talk about UX at the time. Um, I was a tech writer for 10 years. I, actually, I was a typesetter for 10 years. Then I was a tech writer for 10 years. I wrote m m software manuals, software and hardware manuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, a um, friend of mine, uh, got a job for uh, uh, Symantec. Uh, he ran the Macintosh Utilities uh, division of Symantec. This was in the mid to late 80s. Uh, and uh, his boss had this feeling that maybe they should know something about what their users wanted, that that might be a good idea. It was a novel idea at the time. <laughs> People didn't really think that way. And uh, my friend asked me if I could, uh, he knew that um, I spent a lot of time uh, in the tech writing, talking to people about software design and talking to users because uh, writing manuals like uh, like UX is a user-centered uh, profession. You're basically trying to serve the user. So in the case of uh, writing manuals, you're trying to explain the stuff that doesn't work so that people can use the thing. Uh, and um, so he asked me to go out and do uh, some interviews with users and find out what they, how they use semantic software and how they used other software and whatever. And it turned out that was his, I did a presentation and his boss really liked it. And he'd heard something about usability testing. He said, maybe we should try some of that. And my friend said, yeah, you could, you know, you could do that. So I read up, I read Jacob Nielsen's book at the time and learned how to do usability testing and started doing that. And that was how I stumbled into, uh, UX. Uh, uh, I, I've never really been, a, and we'll get to this later, I'm sure. I never really, I'm, I'm no, not really a designer. I don't think of myself as a designer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually, if you went through the taxonomy of professions in UX, which is now huge, there's like this whole long list of subspecialties and whatnot. 
I'm I've always been basically a UX researcher. So I focused on uh, doing usability testing and talking to users and, and then giving feedback to developers and designers and product managers uh, about what it was that people were going to find confusing or difficult about their products and what they should, what they should improve. Um, I, I also, when I was looking at this question, I thought uh, it's rel it's related to something that I actually learned a few years ago. Um, pe people, you know, people always say, well, how'd you get your jobs and, and or how did you get into this? And I realized that basically every significant advance in my career or change of direction or whatever uh, has come from um, what what we would call nepotism. I don't know if the word how you know how far the word carries, but basically means you, you getting uh, a, a job or a job opportunity, uh, giving a job or job opportunity to friends or relatives. And the downside of it is that giving a job opportunity to friends or relatives sometimes in favor over people who are better for the job. <laughs> so that's the negative connotation of nepotism. In in Ukraine, we have a special word. It's called kumovstvo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, like, you know, helping of the godfather. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I looked it up because that's what you do now with Google. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I had a whole life before Google. And the mm -hmm. difference is like so dramatic in terms of how you relate to information. And, you know, you would never go to the library to look up nepotism. I mean, you might pull a dictionary off the shelf if you were sufficiently motivated, but now you don't even have to be sufficiently motivated. You know, it's just, you could want like a minute of distraction and you just type it in and there you've got more, far more information about it than you'd ever want. So uh, interesting change. So I looked it up and it turns out that uh, nepotism is uh, comes from, the word, I guess it's Latin for nephew. And the origin of it was that, <laughs> that the origin was in the Catholic church that um, popes would uh, being celibate by profession. And so not having children would g give favoritism and favored jobs to their nephews. <laughs> and they didn't give them the nieces because it was a, obviously a patriarchal society. So uh, it, the whole, that whole thing was basically giving your nephew a job uh, and eventually the church, it was so widespread that eventually the church passed uh, a, a law that a, a given pope could only appoint one nephew as a cardinal. So so they don't even try to break it, just, okay, let's just work with that. <laughs> so anyway, so it, when I realized, when I realized this, that I'd always gotten uh, these jobs through friends and relatives, that, mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, and I always knew that I would never have been any good at networking. I, you know, you, you, networking involves uh selling yourself mm -hmm. i just never had that gene to go out and say yeah you should really hire me because i'm really great at x uh it was not my nature but uh what i realized that i had always gotten these opportunities through friends and relatives and or or relatives of friends and um so people had often asked me uh you know how, how should i how, how do i do this how do i break into this exciting field uh, you know, how do I find jobs? And, and my, my, my recommendation changed to um, have friends who are smarter and more uh, aggressive than you are, and they will get really good jobs and then they will hire you. <laughs> that, that's a good advice. That's my recommendation now. <laughs> okay, that, that's a good answer. Anyway, so that's, that's, my, that's my job job story. Okay, okay, <laughs> good, good. Thank you, thank you for the answer. Uh, so, Natalia, go ahead. Uh, my question regarding your book, Don't Make Me Sing. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Steve's books is a top five books recommended for UI UX designers. Uh, uh, because I'm following your work, uh, I know you saying uh, that despite all interface changes around, principles of user experience are still similar. However, is there something uh, that was in the first edition of the book uh, that you would say, okay, it's not applicable anymore? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I really had to think about that one. Uh, um, uh, I don't think anybody's asked me before. Uh, and um, as I, I mean, the, the first thought that comes to mind for me is uh, that what you said that I, I'm, I'm always saying that despite all the changes that are happening, 
uh, that the principles of, of UX and usability and whatnot are, st are still similar. And there, I, in fact, I looked it up in the, in the, in the uh, there's a better Jacob Nielsen quote. If you want to know anything about UX or UI, um, see what Jacob Nielsen has to say about it. Cause he's really, he's very good. I, I, I always agree with him and he writes very well and he's been at it for, for far longer than I have. But I, I quoted him as saying, um, the human brain's capacity doesn't change from one year to the next. So the insights from studying human behavior have a very long shelf life. What was difficult for users 20 years ago continues to be difficult today. And that was sort of my excuse for not changing very much when I did the third edition of the book. Uh, well, I, I, because I believe that, because I really did, you know, I think that's a very important thing to understand that uh, when you think about doing UX for, uh, you know, artificial intelligence or augmented reality or, you know, whatever, that, a lot of the principles are still going to be the same. Where people, people are uh, the the interfaces are different, and there are different. There are often some different issues, but for the most part, uh, it it doesn't really change that much. You have to present things clearly in a way that people can understand. It has to fit in with their understanding of how things work and uh, uh, that kind of thing. So, but I did think about. But I did think about your your question. Is there something that that um, I would say doesn't apply anymore. And uh, there are probably several things. The one that jumped out at me was uh, in the third edition of the book, uh, I still had like a 40 page chapter on home pages. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the, that was part of the history of the book that the book was originally about uh, designing, uh, making usable websites. Mm -hmm. So it didn't even cover, it didn't cover, uh, you know, web apps it didn't cover mobile apps it didn't you know it didn't cover a lot of things um that actually you know people are uh, pe but, but before the third edition came out people had moved from developing basically your standard what we understood as a website that was a desktop website to creating either mobile versions of those or creating applications that you know that did similar things and so one thing that changed a lot was I had this 40 page chapter on, on designing the homepage and, and every, I knew everybody was going to say, but nobody, nobody goes to the homepage anymore, which is sort of true. You know, I mean, one thing that changed was that whereas back in the olden days, people would often enter a website through the homepage, but now since everybody uses things like Google all the time, they basically may jump right to a page that's four levels down in a website, you know. And that's there were those and landing pages are created, which like, you know, like different home pages basically, but for every request that you can actually give in Google. Well, exactly. You just you just you just read my notes here. Um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because 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 one of the things that has changed, and if I ever redo the if I ever do another uh, edition, then uh, that homepage chapter has to uh, be, uh, it's be several things. And one of them is homepages and landing pages because landing pages are in a sense, new homepages and they serve the same function. You know, they're, they're like your gateway from, from how you got there into the material and they have to tell you what you need to know. They give you more background, right? Rather than just dropping you, dropping you on that particular product or service page or whatever. The landing page makes you a soft landing and tells you more about the company or more about more of the context that you need need to know. And so uh, they become, in a sense, another new uh, version of home pages. But I, even 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 in even not including that in the third edition, I basically pointed out that while I agree that most people will not land on home pages on their way to what they're looking for, not not nearly as much as they did historically, uh, a small percentage of how much home pages traffic got historically. But that it, in my observation and my own experience that one of the things that people often do is they will Google into a page that's deep in the site and then they'll want some context. And so what they do, I refer to it as bobbing up to the surface. They look for the homepage link or they look for the about uh, uh, link mm -hmm. and they'd step back up to a higher level to get more general information to see whether they can trust these people to see how big they are to see you know basically is is this really the right place 
for me. So the homepage is still very important. It just doesn't work the same way as it used to. But I that was that was really good that you you went right to landing. Well, that's why uh, that that's why logo always should be clickable. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That was one of my prominent things about homepages was that that's, that's got to work. And you know, back in the day, and this is the sort of things that have changed. Back when I first did the book, the people were arguing about whether people understood that you could click on the logo to go back to the top. No. Uh, right now, I believe that just like very obvious. You know? Yeah, no, everybody everybody knows that. I mean, funny part, you know, that's search engine optimization managers, those who tell you how to make your website in order to be top in Google. I heard, uh, you know, at least a few years ago uh, that uh, don't, like you, you need to make your logo clickable because that's to the UX. But in case you do it, Google don't like it because you basically repeated the link. Yeah, well, so, that, you know, uh, Entirely possible. I mean, the, the, the problem is any of this stuff is full of trade-offs, you know? So you'll go and try and do the right thing, and then somebody will jump up and say, oh, but, you know, <laughs> you're going to lose okay. SEO value. You're going to lose, you know, whatever. And it's that those kinds of trade, that, that'll make you crazy. I mean, it's one reason why I'm glad I'm not a designer. I don't, have to, I don't have to make those kinds of decisions. Um, but it is, there's, there's, always, there's always a, a gotcha. Um, but, yeah, so... The same thing as, as for years, people argued, and I don't know if they still argue because they don't pay any attention, but for years, people argued that it was bad in a mobile app to bury stuff under what they call a hamburger menu because people didn't understand what the hamburger menu was. And I was like, I've never seen anybody who does, you know, at that point, who this was, you know, cell phones and mobile apps had been out for like, uh, you know, years, you know, and, and, and they were still arguing about this. And I said, I don't know anybody who doesn't know that that the, what, that's what the hamburger menu does, who's used a phone for more than a week. Plus, if they can't find the thing that they're looking for, then the only thing that's left to click on is this hamburger, whether they know that's what they look should be clicking on or not. I agree. These arguments linger. But. I remember this for a time when uh, all websites start using hamburger menu and the leads a normal menu in the header. Hey, it was a very crazy time. <laughs> yeah. Everyone was popular to have this, you know, this menu from the left side. It was like, that's additional, that's additional click. That's, you know, why do you do that? Why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? I mean, yeah. you, you're used to all this. You, you're in these discussions all the time and you're like constantly, <laughs> it's, it's like whack-a-mole. You're constantly knocking these, <laughs> these notions. Sure. Okay. So. For everyone in this virtual room, it's clear that uh, user experience is super important. You need to do research, you need to do some business analysis in order to understand how you need to build the digital product. But as the CEO of outsource company, I can tell you that even now uh, we are facing with the people who, who don't understand importance of the design. So like how, in, in your opinion, how you would convince someone that they actually need all of those services to build a great product, like UI, UI UX sketches, wireframes, design, like, you know, obviously you have a name, but how you convince them? Well, uh, yeah, and, and what you're making me, uh, again, appreciate as I do several times a day is the fact that I don't have to do that. I <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I, ha I haven't done client work for like, you know, I've done very tiny amounts of client work with legacy client for the last 15 years, you know, so I'm, I'm never and people who come to me are always people who are convinced of, of the value of this. <laughs> well, obviously, that's why I'm asking. Maybe you can teach us something. No, I know. And I, 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 I actually put I, I, I don't remember what was in it, but I did put a chapter in uh, in the third edition. Um, sort of addressing this, uh, it was called, I like the subtitle. What was the subtitle? Um, the subtitle was, oh, it was, it was, uh, the chapter title was called Guide, Guide for the Perplexed. And the subtitle was Making Usability Happen Where You Live. And I put in sort of the usual, so I have the usual advice for convincing uh, people, convincing management to support and fund usability work was one, demonstrate ROI. So, you know, I, 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 now I, I'm, I'm surprised. I mean, you'll have to tell me about this because you obviously work with these clients all the time. My big 20,000 foot level picture of it is that it used to be impossible 
it used to be very difficult to convince management that there was value into putting user-centered design work in, right? Uh, and and the you know the simple explanation that I always give is, okay, in 2007 or whatever that Steve Jobs did the definitive um, ROI uh, you know case study for proving that that was uh, that it was true that you could make money by designing things that work better for users, you know. So it, it was hard to argue with the success of Apple. And it was hard to ignore the fact that they did, that a lot of it was uh, dependent on the fact that they had put this effort into making things that were easy for people to use, you know? And so I felt like that was the turning point that before that I had, I had always said, and I was wrong as often, um, that it was hard for me to imagine that uh, user-centered design, UX, whatever, would ever be a major uh, line item in budgets where you would companies would spend the same amount on UX or some reasonable fraction of it as they did on things like marketing. And uh, that I was not confident at all that UX would ever get to that position. I thought we'd always be fighting for a space at the table because management would never be convinced that it was worth spending money on. But my perspective was that this got turned around. So that's why you now see so many, you know, you see people desperate to hire UX people. Well, senior UX people, they're desperate to hire, but not, mm. uh, not, not entry level people. Um, and you see companies having big budgets, having whole departments, having, uh, you know, C-level UX uh, people. Yeah, like Natalia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And... Um, so from my position, not being out there in the field and talking to these poor people who are struggling to get people to spend money on it, uh, or, or pay attention to the results, you know, sometimes they'll spend money on it and then not pay any attention to the, the reports, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, I thought that was sort of fixed. <laughs> you're telling me, you're telling me it's definitely not. Yep. You've got poor people at lower echelons who are coming to you and saying, geez, we need what you guys have, you know, and, and, and help us. We, we understand completely. This is going to be so good for us, for our product, for our company. Um, but can you help us convince our bosses? And I'm trying to think of what else I, uh, what else I said in this chapter, I'm, I'm looking at the subheadings. Um, one was, one was to, to get these higher ups. My, my favorite is get these higher ups to watch a usability test. You know, I feel like if, if the people higher up the food chain have not watched usability tests of their product, then they don't understand, the, they are far less likely to understand the actual value of this stuff. That it's often a conversion experience for people when they, well, you probably had this experience, you bring people in who have not seen the usability test of their product and they're like, oh my God, you know, what, what, what are we thinking? <laughs> we mm -hmm. should do, we got to do more of this. So, so you're basically showing them that, okay, it's actually doesn't work and your mind actually doesn't work. You must change it. Not only does it, not only does it not work, but we just proved to you by spending half an hour that it doesn't work. <laughs> you know? yeah, efforts, and, but... and you're not, and you're not stupid, Mr. Boss. You can see that this is going to cost you money. This is going to cost you sales. This is going to cost you conversions, mm -hmm. whatever, you know? And I, I just find that that's the kind of the richest thing. Uh, uh, and so for people who don't actually have usability testing in place or, or a lot of UX in place, then my recommendation, which I really like, this is my favorite recommendation always was, was, um, on your own time, you poor person down in the trenches, uh, do, uh, a, do a usability test of your product's competitors. Um, and people will come to see that because they're far more curious about their competitors than they are about their own stuff. Um, and by testing the competitors, you're not making anybody within your company look bad. You're making the, the competitors look bad, but it ha has the same uh, effect that people watching it will say, Oh, geez, we, you know, how, do, how does our stuff do if we do this? Mm -hmm. um, so I've always suggested that for people who are stuck with sort of no, no entry point, no, no leverage, whatever, but um, I'm trying to think uh, my, my, <laughs> my uh, and, you know, empathize with management. So kind of figure out what, what it is that management is trying to solve and then approach it as, as, you know, presented as things that are going to help their pain points 
um, rather than just general, this is going to make the product better. But, um, but m m the one that's most, most mine, uh, I wish we would disagree with is, is know your place in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so I'm suggesting that, that humility is a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing in, in this situation. Um, it, it doesn't go around, doesn't help to go around with the attitude that you're, pre you're presenting the truth, you know, which people sometimes will when they're in that position, you know, cause they're very, they're, they believe in it. They're clearly enthusiastic and they know it work and they will know, know it will help. But sometimes it means they're not quite as, as, uh, they're a little more arrogant about it. Than, uh, so, Natalia, go ahead. Following the previous question, uh, you have been consulting companies for over 25 years. From your observation, what do stakeholders often misunderstand when it comes to product UX design? <laughs> uh, yeah, another good question. I, I, I mean, I guess I always come back to the fact that uh, people... Uh, approach these things from their own point of view. So stakeholders approach the problems from their own point of view and that they're not very good like most of us at putting ourselves in other people's shoes. So they, they have this kind of tunnel, tunnel vision. You know, they already understand what's wrong and what needs to be fixed. And uh, that's kind of based on their own, uh, you know, the way they react to things. So if they don't like this particular kind of interface, they're not going to like that. They're going to say that kind of interface is bad. And again, that's where I found that you use watch having people watch usability tests helps that, you know, it's like you, if you're watching a usability test, then you sort of see, Oh, wait, this person doesn't think at all the same way I do about this. Uh, see, and they have to see more than one. So they know that it's not just, Oh, that was like the stupidest person in the world. They see a couple. And after they've seen a couple, it's like, Oh, oh my God! Our, our, the people who buy this stuff are actually diverse, and they don't think the same way I do, and I think it opens people up. Um, but uh, it, it, what else do they misunderstand? I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there are a lot of things they misunderstand. But again, I, I, I'm not in those trenches. You know, I haven't been in those trenches in so long that I, I'm, 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 I'm not presented, you know, I mean, you guys are presented with it every day. You've got, you know, clients who, you've got stakeholders who make you tear your hair out. You know, it's, I highly recommend it. You're too young to retire, but <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure you're good at it. You know, I mean, you know, you kind of know how to, I was going to say how to play them, but I didn't really mean that. I mean, you know what to do. So the main thing that they misunderstand that they actually cannot imagine that someone is thinking differently than they are. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the way we are. It's the way we're wired. You know, we, we, we all tend to, mm -hmm. think that. it's like, we, you know, we see people on the news giving their reaction to some, you know, event that happened and it's like, what? <laughs> How can they think that? <laughs> okay. We had one startup who come to us and say, hmm, I don't have any competitors. Like we are unique and you are not in the beginning of the, you know, human argument in the wheel, like 21st century. After 10 seconds, we find uh, five really close competitors to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, that's, you know, that's understandable. I mean, that's sort of human nature. I mean, you, to, to be going in there and doing this enterprise, you kind of, you know, at some level, you have to believe that it's unique and you get caught up in that. Mm, yeah. You know, it's, it's good up to a point, but it's not good when it makes you blind to... Okay, so I will tell you some real story. We have the project just right now, uh, the great product, first in the world. And uh, I, I fortunately can name, cannot name it because it's under NDA, but uh, this is the really first product in its field. It's making money, it's perfectly working, have millions of users. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the sense of UI and UX as well, it's not the best not 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 the best that can happen so in your opinion shall we do some improvements or no or you know just don't touch it it's working don't touch it uh because you know uh, in case i would ask the software development that definitely would tell it's working don't touch it but what in case of the ux there's two there's two things here one is is it out of date in terms of it looks old 
and so that's a detriment. Um, in which case, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with with pre presenting a new look as long as you don't break everything, you know, while you're doing it and, mm -hmm. and, and change the way stuff works. There's actually an excellent article related to both these questions. I went and looked it up and you can put the link in, in mm -hmm. the podcast um, by uh, a woman named Christina Wotke. Uh, and the title is great. It's Users Don't Hate Change, They Hate You. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, she's uh, one of the, the best quote in it is, uh, says, um, um, what's users don't hate change. Users hate change that doesn't make their life better, but makes them have to relearn everything that they knew. And that's so true of redesigns. And it's often true of, of wholesale redesigns is, uh, and then she goes on to say, in fact, users don't like change that might improve their lives if they don't perceive the value of that change. So there's two things going on. One, if you, if you make major changes all at once, then they have to put in work. You know, they've got to relearn how to do things. And some of the things, the way they did them was more convenient for them than the way they have to do, them, do that now. And it may be that for some percentage of people, the new way of doing it is more convenient for them, but there's always going to be a percentage of people for whom it's less convenient. And the people for whom it's less convenient are the people who are going to be sending you email and, and commenting online about you and, and all that. And um, um, the, um, the other is that uh, th they, they don't like change that might improve their lives if they don't perceive the value of that change. So you have to make it clear to them what the value is, you know, what, the, why this is, you have to make it clear why this is better in a way. And you have to test that. You basically, you know, you have to basically have people try using the new version and find the people who have gripes with it and figure out how to make it clear to them that this is, is better or else go back and tweak it so it actually is better for everybody. But the, um, uh, you know, I, I, the one thing that I read about, about this, and again, I haven't been involved in major de redesign for forever, uh, is people who have succeeded the best often are people who have uh, previewed, set up a forum beforehand, announced well in advance that they're working on a new, new version of things and allow people access to some portions of it and giving them a chance to comment on it in a forum so that they both learn what people in advance, what people's rea bad reactions are going to be. And mostly that they give people a chance to feel like they had uh, a say in these changes. You know, it, it's, it's sort of like, if you just, if you just say, we've got a great new version coming out next week. And then the next week it's, here's our great new version. It's like, you're dropping a house on their heads. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you, they know that some things are going to change that they won't like. Everybody knows that mm -hmm. <laughs> about any redesign. You have to put time into relearning how to use it, mm -hmm. you know? And, but if you tell them in advance, we're working on this. And if you want to take a sneak peek at, at some of it and give us feedback, that's great. Uh, it makes people feel heard. It makes people feel like, you're not this authoritarian, whatever, that's, you know, making these changes without any input from them. And that's like the best advice I've heard. So basically never come to the point where you need to redesign everything drastic, like always iterate, right? Like a baby steps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, that's, it's much, that's much more palatable. It's all, uh, the problem is that there are some changes that it's hard to make incrementally. You know, if you're making changes that require these specific individual changes require that your database be redone, then you can't like do them individually. But on the other hand, you can have people try them out, you know, uh, without having had your whole online database go to the new version. Uh, and so you should do that. So, so okay. it, it's, a, it's, trans, it's transparency. It's, a very, it's very valuable to be transparent about it and to make people feel like they have a say in it. Uh, rather than rather than just drop it on them, that would be. That's not from personal experience. That's from stuff that I've read. Yeah, I understood. Well, I mean, you know, uh, I believe everyone's supposed to learn all of the time, all of their lifetime. To be honest, I think. So, okay, um, 
the next question will be the question from my students. There are two of them and uh, you can answer, you know, in any, any direction. So the first one, do you know by heart 10 heuristics of Jacob Nielsen? And, uh, you know, I explain why I'm asking this question, because I'm the lecturer in, in National University Lviv Polytechnic, and Natalia, by the way, too. And uh, my students, they have the homework where they're supposed to learn those of 10 heuristics by heart. Uh, so, you know, uh, they, they told me, like, in case this guy is so cool, does he know them? So, do, do you know them? It's, uh, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know them by heart. I don't know them by heart. Um, I agree with all of them. I don't know them by heart. But if you gave me a list of 20, mm -hmm. I could check off the 10 that were actually on Jacob's list. So I can recognize them. Mm -hmm. I can't necessarily recall them. So again, for the students, that's really important. It's not a joke. <laughs> 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 you need to, it, you need to, you do need to have those in your in your mind. You know that, that they're 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 very valuable. And if you've done a bunch of this work, then you start. You know they're in your they're in your mind already. It's just a matter of can you pull them out. So it's not about you know when it's just ten of them. It's just to understand them and understand the principles, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and I I always have to say people never ask about. Uh, uh, the the heuristics, but uh, when they do, on rare occasions when they do, I always have to mention that in fact those the original uh, list of usability heuristics uh, were developed by a collaboration of Jacob Nielsen um, and Ralph Molik, uh, both of whom are Danes and they were in Denmark at the time, um, and Jacob and I feel bad badly because. Ralph never gets credit. <laughs> and Ralph's a great guy and he's done a, a huge amount of, of incredibly valuable work in usability. Um, okay, I will change the book in our university. But they, wrote the, original, they wrote the original paper together about, mm -hmm. with a, it was a list of nine heuristics and they, but the, the paper was about how to do a, uh, a um, what do you call it, heuristic, uh, uh, what's the, the thing that you do uh, with them? You have a, you have a, you have. It's very specific. You have, you have a panel of several people, go through whatever the thing is and check off where they don't, where they fail in one of the heuristics, and then the panel compares notes actually after the fact and summarizes it down to mm -hmm. uh, main problems. It's a way of, of doing an expert review of the usability of something, um, and the paper was about that. But but Jacob, on the other hand, Jacob in the meantime has several times updated and revised the list and amplified, written great pieces, amplifying what each of these heuristics means. Uh, and uh, they added, he added one more to the, to the list. So, so uh, Jacob, I suppose, gets more credit than Rolf. Um, but I feel bad that Rolf never gets any credit. Okay. I will, at least in our books for the students, I will make sure that Rolf will be mentioned. So the second question from my students is about what kind of characteristics as a person you need to have in order to become the researcher? Uh, like, what do you need to, what skill set you need to have to, to become a you, basically, right? What do you think? <laughs> to become a legend. <laughs> uh, you know, the people, people have come from so many different um, uh fields and backgrounds and personality types and whatever uh, into this field and, and been successful at it, uh, that it makes me stop a little and think about, well, what is it they, they have in common? I will tell an anecdote from uh, years ago. I, you know, I've always gone, except for the last two years, unfortunately, because of COVID, gone to the um, Usability Professionals Association conference, which is, has always been a very great deal of fun for me. So I've gone for like 25 years. And um, uh, like eight years ago or something, I was walked into, you know, as with some of these conferences, they'll have sort of banquet night where everybody will have dinner or whatever uh, mm -hmm. together in a big conference, a big ballroom. And they'll have something, some stupid entertainment, like uh, an improv troupe or a magician or a ventriloquist or whatever. <laughs> And I walked into this room, and so there, there are like, like 
at that time, there it was probably like 400 uh, people at the conference of my peers. Uh, and I, it occurred to me as I walked into the room, I looked around and I thought, you know, uh, these are all really nice people. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, I've like known like two jerks in my whole career who were in UX. You know, I thought, how rare is that? That's really odd. And then it was this, this big light bulb went over my went off over my head. And I thought, oh wait, you've got to 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 do this. You probably are a fairly empathetic person. You know, you're <laughs> capable capable of empathy. That's mm -hmm. kind of a job, kind of a you know main characteristic job requirement almost. Mm -hmm. And and that's that struck me mostly. What struck me was really lucky that in mean, this profession where there are all these really nice people. Um, and, you know, whereas, I mean, I, I, you know, how long, how long would I last in, in marketing? You know, I'd like, I, I just, <laughs> I'd be, I'd be profoundly depressed in a month. Yeah. Or in sales. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so, uh, so there's that empathy, empathy is good, but a lot of, you know, many people are, are, are it, it's not like you have to be overly empathetic. You just have to be reasonably empathetic. Uh, things uh i would say uh an interest in how people think so a lot of people will come from like uh you know uh psychology uh mm -hmm. people who might have considered studying psychology in college you know whether they did or not uh i ended up as an english major i was be torn between i started out in physics and flunked out because I couldn't understand calculus at all because I had a terrible teacher, um, and, <laughs> and I had choice between English and psychology because they both had a lot of a lot of uh, electives, and they were both interesting to me. And I probably should have chosen psychology, but I chose English. And um, so, uh, an interest in how people an interest in how people think. Um, I want to say curiosity, but I'm like not, you know, people, one of the things I try and disabuse people of is the notion that I'm, I'm endlessly curious. People seem to expect that I'm going to be one of those people who's curious about everything. And I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So but I think curiosity is, I think curiosity is, is good, but. Uh, yeah. Everything has a limits, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, for myself, I, I think one of the things for me is, and why I was able to do tech writing well, is I really like a good explanation. I like things to be, I like somebody who can make something clear, you know, and I feel like that's a valuable attribute because what you're doing when you're, uh, you know, doing uh, UX work is you're trying to figure out what's not clear, you know. For the most part, I mean, you're trying to figure out what's broken, but you're also trying to figure out what's not clear. So, uh, I think liking a good explanation. So, so this is completely not useful at all for for your students. <laughs> well, at least they know the answer. But yeah, but 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 also, I think I, I think that the 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 I think the answer is if you find UX interesting, if you've been exposed to UX and you think that seems like an interesting thing to do, then you're qualified. <laughs> okay okay they will listen to this you got to put in the work and learn and you know and learn it but but i think that i think that's why people are coming into it from so many different fields and work hard <laughs> work hard not not necessarily something i was always capable of but yes what is the most recent request or really interesting challenge you faced with ah uh yeah i had to think about this one oh uh, because most of what I've been doing in recent years is sort of support for the for my two books, you know, answering email and giving little. I go out and I, I do occasional podcast and I uh, do Q and A sessions for people who who ask me as a group of people, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, uh, the, the probably the most challenging was I took a, took on a took on a a, a small client job uh, once in the last couple of years, and I shouldn't say this, but I I, I had a difficult client, 
And it had been so long. I really haven't had that many difficult clients, even when I was doing the client work. Um, but uh, I'm a very nice person. But there were reasons why it, that person was difficult as a client. And uh, probably mostly the, too opinionated for their own good. Uh, and so that was that was challenging. And I, I you know, I, I you will face that, as you know, you'll face that in your client work. <laughs> Clients can be difficult. <laughs> let let me help you. Well, okay, but help me as I want it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd appreciate you giving me my opinion again. Yeah. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, why design, uh, good design must be expensive or is expensive? <laughs> <laughs> I, the notes I wrote to myself were, um, why, why are good plumbers so expensive? Why are good carpenters so expensive? Why is a good surgeon expensive? Why do good music concerts cost so much? You know, it's like, uh, um, because uh, they're in greater demand, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the, the problem is it's, it's, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to be looking for a designer, uh, because it's, it can be so hard to tell whether somebody's a good designer or not until you, until you're working with them. So I suppose you have to rely a lot. It's, I suppose it's really important to talk to people who have worked with them. Uh, so, uh, but not, not that there aren't, not that there are aren't people who are less expensive who aren't really good you know i mean i one of the reasons when i wrote my my book one of the reasons why i wrote it was in fact the main reason why i wrote it was so i could raise my consulting rates because i was at the time i'd been consulting for 10 years and or more and i was charging like 10 percent of what jacob nielsen was charging for for an hour a day of his time and, but I didn't feel like I could raise my rates because I didn't have, uh, I had no credentials at all. I hadn't done any, I hadn't published anything. It wasn't doing public speaking. Wasn't, so I was, I was, had a very happy client base who always passed me on to other people, but I wasn't known outside. So I wanted to raise my, raise my rates. Um, and uh, it turned out after I was done, after I spent this miserable year writing the book that uh, people, it, made it clear to me that I could have raised my rates anyway. So it was just a matter of, of confidence. Um, but so there are good, there are good people out there who are not charging that much, but it's, it's hard to tell. How, how does that answer sit with you that they're, they're expensive because, because uh, they're good and so more people want them so they can charge more. Is it, it feels like there's another question behind that. Why, why are good, must, must they, I like the must, must good designers be expensive? <laughs> well, no, they want to be. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. We will not put this online. So let's talk about cutting your rates in half. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So, uh, the next one uh, will be really quick questions, and we didn't we didn't give it to you to prepare, obviously. And uh, right now we need fast and honest answers. So be ready. I'm, I'm not good at those. Okay, yeah. Okay, so three, two, one. Tom or Jerry? Uh, oh, I'm indifferent. I guess a mild mild plus to Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Nielsen or Norman? Oh, um, I shouldn't say this, but Nielsen. <laughs> <laughs> Startup or enterprise? Um, again, like them both. Um, I, startup's more fun, but it's more harrowing. So uh, if, I, if I was out there now and had to choose, I would probably choose enterprise because I'm sort of risk averse by disposition. Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh, uh, oh, geez. Star Trek, I guess. I, 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 Star Trek, except... Yeah. Um, except Star Wars had Harrison Ford. So that's kind of, it's probably Star Wars. Remote work or work from office? Uh, um, yeah, um, remote work. That's all. That was easy. Thank you. Really, thank you. And thank you for listening to us today. Uh, thank you to the Steve for having a time with us today. It was a big pleasure and honor uh, to stay in touch. And guys... I hope you got the great lessons and interesting topic today and till the next episode. Bye. Bye.
Oh, thank you. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, stay safe, and I hope things go much better.